Good morning, everybody. Welcome in. Will you stand and we'll sing together this morning?
like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. is within me bless his holy name 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forgives all our iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. May your praise ever be on our lips, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Hey, good morning, church family. You sound good. You look decent. Happy birthday, Fleur. Let's throw that out there right now. Um, a little different transition this morning. Uh, I just want to invite us to a family moment. Can we do that? We're family and we're, and we're here. Uh, one very quick observation at the front end. I am not Pastor Scott. <clears throat> um, last week when I was, when I was teaching, I, I said, Pastor Scott will begin a brand new series next week in the book of Daniel. Well, next week is here, and we're not going to begin that series. Uh, last week, I also said that Pastor Scott is home not feeling well. He's still not feeling well. Um, if you're following along with social media, you kind of know um, some, some of what happened. But bottom line, through the holiday weekend, he continued to feel worse, some abdominal pain, and ended up going to urgent care, ended up going to the ER, ended up getting admitted uh, for several days this week. And uh, so he is home now. He's recovering. Pain is sort of un under control and he's healing. And so we want to continue to pray for him. Um, so we just sort of, football season kicked off. So we're, we're just calling an audible. Um, and we decided to kind of push back Daniel a little bit. He's really been pouring into that text and looking forward to kicking off that series. So um, in our conversations, we said, well, let's just bump that a week. Um, Lord willing, I'm just telling you right now, Lord willing, we'll start that next week. Um, either way, come next week, we're going to continue to gather as a body of believers. Um, but as it looks, hopefully he'll be back. So Pastor Scott, we love you. Um, continue to pray. We want to continue to pray for him. Um, so um, stay with me. Don't even want to get up and leave, please. <laughs> couple people this morning, it's like, wow, are you preaching this morning? Yes. Are you staying? So um, where's Jason and Marley? I think they're still working first time guests. I said, I'm going to look for you. Don't, don't leave. Stay with me. So, um, but thanks for being here. There's nothing like being in the room. Amen. And there's nothing like being in the room. So um, thanks for just sharing this moment. I just want to go to the Lord in prayer and, and just ask him to continue to be with our pastor, uh, provide healing for him but also just for the direction of our church as we move forward. You're seeing a lot of things about our vision weekend coming up, October 1st and 2nd. And, and just as the elders have been praying, you know, where's God taking us as a church? What does that look like? What is our church going to look like? Um, we just want to continue to pray. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer and just spend a moment with him right now. As you turn to the Lord, would you just ask him first to meet you in this place this morning? Would you be honest enough to say, God, whatever you want to do in me this morning, I invite you to do that, and I just surrender myself to you. <clears throat> Teach me, mold me, shape me, conform me more to your image. Maybe this morning you're sitting here, you've never placed your trust in Christ, and you have a lot of questions Maybe you've come into this place, there's, there's hurt, there's stuff going on in your life that nobody knows about in this room but you, and would you just be willing to just lay that before the Lord at just an honest moment? If you're online and you're attending with us, we love you, we're praying for you, and we'd love to engage with you there as well, but ask God to meet you during this time. And just join me then praying for our church and for our pastor and his healing. So, Father, as we gather in this place, we do so with hearts that are eager to hear from you. 
Lord, both as a church and our direction and the intention of our mission and our ministry and our strategy to be more like Jesus, to be more passionate about connecting people to Jesus for life change. And Lord, we know that the enemy does not want that to happen. We just surrender it to you, God. We surrender this place and this people to you. Our thoughts, our ideas, our strategies. Our, God, we just want to follow you. Pray for our pastor right now, Father, that you would continue to strengthen his body, that you'd continue to bring healing. Lord, you would surround him, give him peace, give him strength. Lord, give him wisdom as he continues to press into your word to, to lead us as a body of believers. Lord, be with Shanna and the girls. and Lord, just the disruptions of, of normal life, whatever normal looks like these days. And Lord, would you just surround them? Would you, would you strengthen them, give them energy, give them rest? Even draw them closer to you in this season. And we pray for healing for Pastor Scott. You'd continue to touch his body and, and strengthen him. Lord, for us in this room, just meet us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're kind of in between the series, right? We've just finished our Scent series through the summer. Uh, we're beginning to press into Daniel uh, next week. And so this is sort of our, our in-between. How do we transition from one to the other? And last week I, I mentioned something that, that, that Paul says in, in his letter to the Galatians that he says, you were running a good race. Who kept, who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? And so I was pressing back into that idea this week of what it means to be sent and, and what it means to sort of be sidetracked in that process. Or as we look forward to Daniel to, uh, to, to take a stand in a, in a broken, in culture, how do, how do we do that? Well, we run the Christian race with perseverance. And so uh, I want to invite you to go with me this morning to go, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. And I want to look at a passage of scripture probably familiar to, to most of us. If you've been around church, you've probably heard this passage, you've read this passage. <clears throat> but as I was sitting yesterday, um, getting ready to watch my Cubs lose, um, sitting on the deck, and I was watching my neighbors across the street frantically pack their truck with all their NC State flags and getting ready to go tailgate, and it's pouring buckets of rain, and I'm going, stay home, stay dry, you know? Um, but how many of you got out yesterday? I talked to a couple after first service. I got out yesterday and enjoyed some football. A few, a few of you, you, you've, you ventured out, right? It's like, we're going to persevere. We're going to do this. We live in a sports crazed culture. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and we need to understand, and, and I say that because Paul is writing to a church in a city that has a sports crazed culture. So it, this is not unfamiliar. I think you'll resonate with some of the stuff that Paul is saying to them based on kind of who we are as, as a people. Um, I started thinking about this and, and uh, I started thinking about runners, right? Because Paul is using an illustration here. Paul gets it. He understands his culture. And so he's using these illustrations. So I looked up some famous runners. Anybody remember Jesse Owens? Uh, I don't know if, if you were around during that time. Jesse Owens was born in 1913. Um, he, he was a runner, died in 1980. He, he's most well known for winning four gold medals in the 1936 Olympics. Was anyone there? Yeah, I probably didn't think so. But he changed culture as we know it, not just being a great athlete, not just being a great runner, uh, but even today, USA's top track and field athlete that's named each year is given the Jesse Owens Award because he had such an impact on the culture. Anybody remember a name named Roger Bannister? Uh, Roger Bannister was the first person time to run uh, a mile in under four minutes. Uh, they, they believed that it's like there's no way that a human being could run that distance that fast and actually run under a four minute mile. Now, I'll just be honest with you, I don't know how people get up and run at all. Okay? Um, we have some runners in the room. Come on, I'd be loud and proud. It's okay. Any runners in the room? I don't understand you. Um, 
Julie, I see that hand, very proud back there. Uh, whenever I get the urge to run, I lie down and it goes away. And so, um, but runners, it's a unique breed. So when Paul's using this illustration, it makes a lot of sense. Anybody remember the name Catherine Switzer at all? Catherine was the first woman to run uh, the New York City Marathon. Uh, she registered in 1967 to run the New York City Marathon. At that point, AAU rules said there's no woman can do this. They actually believed that a woman was not physically capable of running that distance. And, and so they, there was a, a ban on women running this, this race at all. Catherine in 1967 was able to actually register she got her, her bib, her number, and she was running. And the picture that you see uh, is actually during the race, one of the, one of the guys that was a race coordinator um, of the New York City Marathon for years and years, very adamant, very purist about the race, cut in on her during the race, realizing it was a woman, and, and tried to rip her bib off and take her out of the race. Um, but two guys that were running with her, one was a track coach at a men's with a men's team at a college who saw her potential as a runner and started coaching her, was running with her, and also her fiance was running with her at the time. Um, and so they protected her, and so she actually finished. She was the first woman to register and actually run the New York City Marathon. Uh, you probably remember a, a, a really fast guy named Usain Bolt, uh, also known as Lightning Bolt. Anybody remember this guy? Uh, 2009, I believe it was, that he set the 100-meter world record, still known as the fastest man ever, uh, to run the 100-meter in 9.58 seconds. I can't even think about running it that fast. Um, in 2011, some guys were, were monitoring and metering him. And in 2011, they actually measured his speed at one point in his dash at 27.33 miles an hour. Um, the guy's just amazing, right? Um, so th these are runners and, and these are well-known runners. So when we think about Paul writing to this church in Corinth, these, these people who are passionate, sports crazed, he's, he's quick to use this illustration and this idea of what it means to be a runner. Uh, we're familiar with the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games go back to around 776 B.C. Uh, every four years in, in the city of Olympia, they would, they would host these games. But there was also another set of games called the Isthmian Games that were held in the city of Corinth every two years. So every two years, thousands of people would just come to the city of Corinth. Thousands of people as spectators, athletes, uh, just, just fell on the city. And so as Paul is writing to them, understand this is the culture that he's writing into. The Isthmus Games just drew spectators, participants. It was a massive celebration, probably one of the most splendid and, and attended celebrations in all of Greece at that point in time. So with that as a setting, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The context of what Paul is writing up to this point is about our grace and about our freedom in Christ. He, he's talking to them about in your freedom, don't do certain things. And yes, you are free to do certain things, but don't do those things. If it causes someone else to stumble or to struggle, you are called to live a different life because you are followers of Jesus Christ. And so he's going on for a couple of chapters talking about these, these things, not an external Right? He's, not, he's not saying, hey, do this, do this, do this. No, he's saying, because you've been transformed by the grace and the mercy of Jesus, your life should look different. You should be walking differently. You should be living differently. You should be running the race as a follower of Jesus in a way that is different, which leads him to this part of his letter. We're going to begin in verse 24, uh, but I want to just set it up in verse 33, because as Paul is writing all these things, not about the law, I have the law, but I'm not living under the law. I'm living by grace. I'm doing all these things. I'm growing in Jesus. He says in verse 23, I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. That's his concern. And so the very next 
verse, and again, he didn't break the verses, right? This is just a letter to the church. So he picks up in verse 24, pick it up with me. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we, followers of Jesus, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man simply beating the air. No, I beat my body, he says, and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul begins this, this little section with sort of, sort of a, a hypothetical question because he asks them a question that he, he knows they know the answer. It's like preachers do it all the time. And Pastor Scott will often say, some of you will never answer in church, right? Um, but sometimes we ask a question and the room is really quiet. Even, even though you know the answer, you don't, you don't want to say anything, right? So Paul is asking the question. He begins in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So he asked them the question and he knows in his head, he knows in his heart that every Corinthian reading this letter knows that the answer to that question is yes. Oh yeah, we know that. Because, because in Paul's day, the Isthmian games, there was no second place. There was no third place. There was only a winner. There was one winner. Well, we live in a culture where, where everybody gets a trophy, right? You're lousy. You're lousy. Kid, you are not a good t-ball player, but here's a trophy, right? During this era, they, they knew full well. When Paul asked this question, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? And the Corinthian church immediately would go, yeah, we know that. And so he clarifies it by saying, run in such a way as to get the prize. Which begs me to ask the question, what's the prize? Right? It's not simply the, the little crown that they would get that was made out of like leaves and stems and, and vines. It's actually where we get our word diadem or crown. That's what they would get. That was no gold, no platinum, no silver, no metal, just this crown that they would get. But they were noted as the winner. So when I look at this, I'm going, so what's, what's the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. How do I run in such a way to get the prize? How do I, uh, how do I, how do you run the race of the Christian life in such a way as to win? What is winning? What is the prize? Well, first off, I want, again, I want to clarify, this is written to those that are following Jesus. If you're sitting here, you're with us online, and you've never come to trust Jesus, that's where your race begins. That's not the end of the race. That's the beginning of the race. But, but what's he talking about here? What is the prize? Is the prize heaven? No, I, I don't believe it is. Because that, that, would, that would be somehow implying that, that Paul is saying, well, you have to work your way to heaven. No. What are we, what are we running toward, right? He's, he's not implying works. He's not implying, hey, do all the right things and, and hope that your prize then is heaven at the end of your life. Oh, God says, hey, you, you've run well. You've done all the right things. Come on in. Now he's writing to believers. He's writing to people who've already placed their trust in Christ. So what is the prize? The prize of chasing hard after Jesus is more Jesus. Uh, the prize, the way to win is, is to grow deeper in your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ, to know him more. What a gift, what a prize. As we grow to become more like Jesus, we, we become more concerned with his thoughts, his ideas, his mission than my own. The prize is, is to one day stand, as Jesus told the parable in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents where he's saying, hey, all the things, Dave, that have been entrusted to you, your time, your treasure, your talent, the truth that I've entrusted to you, you need to live as a good steward so that Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 23, when we stand before him, what does he say? He looks at us and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. See, the goal of running the race to win the prize is that you could stand before the judge who would say, you won. 
I want to stand before Jesus one day and then hear him say, Dave, well done, my good and faithful servant. With all that I've entrusted to you, you have been faithful. You've run the race with perseverance. You've lived in a way that, that loved me and honored me and brought glory to me. That's the prize. The prize of pursuing Jesus is more Jesus. The prize of pursuing his mission is more mission. The prize of pursuing the focus and attention of Jesus Christ and his kingdom is more of his kingdom. It's not the pursuit of things here. It's not for the pursuit of, of gifts or prizes or somehow God's blessing on our life here. That's a distorted American version of what we say the gospel really is. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What kind of prize is that going to be? <laughs> to know that we stand before God and he looks at you and he says, well done, you've run the race and you won. So what will it take? There's a lot of things in this text, but can I just share three things with you? Is that okay? This is one of those moments I ask a question, it's okay to respond. Is it okay? I'm going to share three things and we won't take long. See, if we're going to run the Christian life as if eternity depends on it. If we're going to run the Christian life, run the race of the Christian life in a way that eternity depends on it, I think Paul is telling us three things. One, we have to have determination. We have to have determination. Look at verse 25. Paul says, everyone who competes, there's a decision that was made to compete. See, see, when someone decides to run the New York City Marathon or the Boston Marathon, as we've had people in our church do these things, and again, I don't understand why you were compelled to do those things, but at, at some point you have to go through the, the process. You have determined that you're going to do that. And so you go through the application process. See, we all make determinations at some point. The question is, do we stay with our decision? Many of us on January 1st determined to do something. And by January 2nd, we are determined not to do that. How many of you know, seriously, show of hands, how many of you have ever joined a gym somewhere within the first week of January? Come on, seriously, you made the decision, first week of January, you're gonna, I'm going to join a gym. And, and then that, that's over, right? I joined a gym one time, I thought, hey, first I just have to show up. I just got, I got to get in the parking lot. So I stopped at the donut shop on the way and I, I made it to the parking lot. And I said, tomorrow I'm going to go in. And tomorrow never came. So, but, but there's a determination. See, when we come to know Jesus Christ, we give our life to Christ. We are born again. We're born new and fresh. And to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ takes determination. Why? Because Satan is now coming after me. He wants to come after me with everything that he can. And, and we, we have this idea sometimes that, oh, once I give my life to Jesus, life is easy. Life is going to be great now that I've come to know Jesus. But we realize that's not true. Life is hard. Well, when you make a determination in your head to do something, your body, your flesh begins to speak against it in every way possible. We're going to see this when we press into Daniel, because in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. In other words, he made a decisive decision of his will to honor God. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. He says, look, be like Daniel. Make this decision. I am going to honor God. I'm going to be determined to walk in fellowship with God. And I'll promise you this. The more you desire to do that, the more Satan is coming after you. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians or in Romans chapter 7. I have it marked in my Bible, two words, civil war. Because Paul said, man, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I continue to do. What a wretched sinner I am. The more you pursue to walk in fellowship with Jesus, the more Satan's coming after you. He's going to speak to your flesh. He's going to bark at you with everything he possibly can to distract you from relationship with God and fulfillment of his mission. And some of those things are going to be evil. And some of those things are just going to be a comfortable distraction. We talked about that last week. And Paul is saying, look, you have to live determined. What about you this morning? 
Uh, are you determined to win your spiritual race? Uh, or, or do you just take this casual approach of going, well, you know, I prayed a prayer and, and one day I think I'm going to heaven. So I think until that point, it's all cool. I just want to accumulate what I can and, and have fun until that moment. See, now I don't think there's a back door to heaven, but I think there's a difference in how we meet our Savior in that moment. And Paul is saying, run in such a way as to get the prize. Be determined. Let me introduce you to another runner. His name was Bob Wheeland. Bob Wheeland, in, in November of 2nd, 1986, he ran the New York City Marathon. That day, there were 19,413 runners that started the race. How many runners? 19,000. 413 runners. Let me tell you about Bob, and I'm going to tell you why he was the most important person that ran that race. Because he finished dead last. Out of 19,413 runners, he finished 19,413th. Now, I know some of you competitors, you're thinking, what a loser, <laughs> right? Seriously, be honest. It's like, what a loser, really? Well, what made him so significant? What was so different about Bob Wheeland? Well, he finished the race, get this. He finished the New York City Marathon in 98 hours. That's four days. Four days, two hours, 48 minutes, and 17 seconds. How many of you are going, dang, what a loser? He shouldn't get a trophy, right? There's no trophy for 19,413th place. He set the record for the slowest marathon in history. You're saying, Pastor Dave, why is this guy memorable? Why should we remember Bob Wayland? Probably because he ran the race with no legs. Bob Wayland ran the New York City Marathon with no legs. But he finished... Four days, two hours, 48 minutes, 17 seconds later. You see, Bob Whalen would sit on a 15-pound saddle. He would cover his fist with, with leather pads. And he would just thrust himself forward one arm length at a time. Four years before this, Bob Whalen actually walked across the United States of America. An estimated 4,900,000 plus thousand steps to raise awareness for a, a special program that he was helping launch in school. He would catapult himself forward one arm length at a time with the determination that we need to have to live the Christian life. It's not easy, but I'm determined to win. The year was 1969, and while serving in Vietnam, this is what Bob says, he says, my legs were blown off instantly from an 82 millimeter mortar round. He said, in that moment, he said, I saw my legs fly in one direction and my life went in another. He was pronounced dead, DOA. He was put in a body bag in the 14th EVAC hospital in Vietnam. And as he lay in that body bag, he says, I had one breath in me. And he said, with all I could do, he said, I took that breath. He said, I praise God that someone in that room saw the bag move. And he ran over and he unzipped the bag and helped to restore Bob. And what he says in that moment is simply this. He says, you see, I lost my legs, but I didn't lose my heart. That changed the trajectory of Bob Whelan's story. And I firmly believe it changed the trajectory and the determination of a lot of people because of Bob's life and Bob's story. What about you? Do you have that same determination as you walk with the Lord, as you run the race to say, I want to finish in such a way that I stand before my King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he looks at me and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. We have to run with a determination. Second, I want you to see that we have to run with focus. 
Verse 25, he picks it up. He says, everyone who competes goes into strict training. He goes into strict training training. There's a focus and intentionality to anything that we do. And Paul clarifies this just a little bit in verse 26, when he says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. So what he speaks of is this idea of strict training. There's an intentionality. And I've talked to so many people through my years of of ministry and they say, Pastor Dave, I'm really trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And my response is always this, listen to me, quit trying. Quit trying to live a Christian life and start training. There's a big difference between living a Christian life or trying to live a better Christian life and training to be intentional as you run the race with determination and focus to honor God with your life. See, you can go through all the motions and attend things and do things and in hopes Well, I'm going to just keep trying hard. I'm going to keep trying hard. He says, no. He says, they go into strict training. Paul uses this illustration elsewhere in his letters. He says, train yourself to be godly. Grow in righteousness. Train yourself to to walk with the Lord. Surround yourself with people that are going to love you, encourage you, and challenge you to run the race. See, what, what Paul understood with the Corinthian readers is that in the Isthmian games, it wasn't simply runners that competed. It also included horse races. uh, It included chariot contests, jumping, wrestling, boxing, throwing the discus, throwing the javelin. And so he picked out this running and this boxing illustration to use right here. Because he knew that whatever games they were competing in, every athlete knew that in order to win, he must have focus. A guy didn't train and compete uh, and and prep to go in and be a boxer only to go throw a javelin or a spear. If you're going to say, I want to, I want to walk a faithful Christian life and fulfill the mission that God has given me, then you train for that. You you press into that. You move into that. So he's speaking here of, of runners. He says, I don't, I don't run aimlessly. I don't, I don't, fight like a man beating the air. And, and so what he's saying is, look, runners don't just start running in a zigzag pattern, do they? I've never seen that kind of race except on the playground when you're playing tag or something. But, but in competition, there's this lane and there's this focus and there's this goal. I am running toward that goal. That is my focus. That is my intent. And I am running with determination because I want to win the prize. I want to stand before the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. So I'm going to run there. He says, they don't don't run aimlessly. They don't fight like a man beating the air. So I've heard preachers talk about this and they think it's like a shadow boxing training. But but the language that Paul uses is actually one of being beaten up and and dazed. If you've ever watched boxers, when they take a hit, sometimes they, they stammer. And, and they, they're swinging, they're going through the motions. And this seems so much like the Christian life to me sometimes. I'm swinging, I'm going through the motions, but I'm not landing a blow anywhere. Because Satan's pummeling me, he's coming after us with all he can. And sometimes life just makes us go, wow, what's going on? And, and so he uses this illustration of, of a man that's just beating the air. Paul says, no, 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 no. He says, he says, we have to be determined. We have to go into strict training, right? Runners run a specific course. Boxers fight in a certain technique. Jab, jab, punch, jab, jab, stay tight. Go, go through the process of training and, and be strict in that process because that boxer wants to know that every blow has to count in, in beating my opponent. I have to block. I have, I have to know what to block, what to keep away, and I know when to jab, so he's using this picture and, he, and Paul's saying, look, man, successful Christian living demands focus. We must have the goal in mind. Our mission is Jesus' mission. Our focus is Jesus' focus. If we're going to run the race to be successful in our Christian life, it's going to look more like Jesus. So what did Jesus see? Let's say Luke 19, 10, I've, not, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. You want to run a race to look more like Jesus? Seek and save the lost. That was Jesus' mission. Matthew 28, go and make disciples. 
This is the mission. This is the focus of Jesus. If we want to keep our life in line with him, what are we going to do? We're going to seek and save the lost. We're going to make disciples. Not just go through the motions, not just running aimlessly, not just beating the air, but landing blows. So we have to have this determination. We have to have a, a focus. Last, I want you to see that we have to have discipline. He says, you have to have a discipline. Verse 27, no, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul says, there's a, a discipline to what I do. I beat my body. Now, Paul presses into this in a couple of different places in scripture. In Galatians chapter five, I mentioned last week where, where he simply says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? I've been here. God, I wanna walk with you. I wanna run with you. God, I wanna fulfill your mission. And all of a sudden stuff happens in my life and I get sidetracked and God brings me back. So Paul is Paul's speaking the same idea to the Corinthian church that he did to the church in Galatia. Don't let people cut in on you. Don't let things come against you. First Timothy chapter four, as Paul is writing to his, his young disciple, Timothy, he says this, he says, um, have nothing, nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales. He says, rather what? Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. There's the prize. There's the prize, the life to come. Godliness has value for this present life and the life to come. So as Paul presses into this idea of discipline, he says, I beat my body. He uses a Greek word here that literally means to give himself a black eye. I'm going to beat my body. I'm going to beat my body into subjection. I'm going to beat against the flesh to walk in the spirit of God. That's what he says in Galatians, right? But be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you won't uh, fulfill the desires of the flesh. So he's using this imagery, I have to discipline myself. I have to do the hard things in my life so that I can walk close to Jesus. It's, it's almost as if Paul was, was boxing against himself, punching himself in the eye. Uh, it's possible that he chose this illustration for the Corinthian church or this metaphor for them because of the rough sport of boxing that they were used to watching every two years. Because in the Isthmian games, unlike modern day boxing, there were no rounds. You just go for it. Now, for any mother in the house that has that great fear of, of BB guns and eyes, I was that kid. Um, a lot of wicked stories about my childhood. That, um, but, but when I was about 13, I had a BB lodged in my eye and I was... Uh, hospitalized and bandaged and ended up in, in uh, retina surgery and everything. It's still good today. Monica takes good care of me and, and makes sure that I'm doing okay. Um, but I will never forget as a young boy, having come through retina surgery, uh, my, my ophthalmologist and my retina surgeon uh, simply said this, Dave, we think you're good to go. You, you can kind of do anything you want in life, except do not become a professional boxer. I said, no problem, no problem. Ne never a personal desire of mine to be a boxer. That was never like something I struggled with, but it was like anytime you're playing sports, you take a shot to the head because it could loosen stuff or especially to the eye, come and see us. And so it was like, I'd regularly go in, took a baseball to the eye, took a racquetball to the eye, took shots to the head. I mean, all kinds of things through life as a kid and as an adult and, and they kind of keep checking stuff. But I'm thinking, okay, boxer was never on my dream bucket list, right? Who wants to do that? But Paul is using this as an illustration because what these people would have known is that there's no rounds. These guys wrap leather around, no padded, no padded gloves. They wrap leather around their hands and they would say, okay, go. And these guys would just sit and beat on each other until one of them gave up or passed out. 
And so it was not uncommon for these guys to experience severe damage to their eyes, to their ears, to their skull, to their nose. And it was brutal. And Paul is saying, I, I, I'm going to be brutal to myself. I'm going to discipline myself in such a way that, right, discipline involves physical discipline and strength. It also involves uh, removing yourself from certain things, abstaining from certain things. Why? Because I'm going to press in to, to Jesus. Therefore, I'm going to choose to deny myself of other things. Uh, what about a spiritual discipline? Prayer. Meditation on scripture, scripture reading, scripture memorization, fasting. When's the last time you had a spiritual fast? Just denying yourself something because you want to seek deeper, more intimate relationship with Christ. He says we have to discipline ourselves. Let me close with this idea and story. I think I shared this with you once before. I just love the story. And I think it fits right here as we run hard after Jesus. <clears throat> there were two men. Uh, these guys worked for the gas company. So help me out. How many guys worked for gas company? Just have that setting. As was their normal routine, working through the city and reading meters, they would... They would drive to an alley and they'd get out and they'd, they'd work the alley and then they'd come back, drive to the next alley, work that alley, come back reading meters. It's coming up on lunchtime and as they, they work the alley and read the meters, um, these guys get kind of toward the end of one of the last houses. They're, they're looking, they're reading the meter. Unbeknownst to them, there's a lady standing in her kitchen looking out the window at these, how many men? Worked for gas company. So she's looking out at these guys reading the meter. What she didn't know was the conversation taking place. Because the one guy, a little bit younger, challenging the older guy to a foot race. And he says, loser buys lunch. He goes, okay, you're on. So they read the meter and they take off running back to the van. They're back to their headed back to the van uh, with everything they got. They're running. As they get to the van and they're teasing each other, they hear steps and breathing behind them. Because this lady is chasing them down the alley. And they're like, ma'am, ma'am, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? She goes, yeah, I think so. She goes, all I know is I saw you guys look at my gas meter and you started running. <laughs> and I thought, something's got to be wrong. I got to run. And so she started running. She's chasing these guys up the alley. You know, I want to run that kind of life with Jesus to where people are looking and going, you know what? Something else is, uh, man, we start pressing into Daniel. We live in a messed up culture. Are we running so hard after Jesus that people are looking at us going, I don't know what's going on over here, but it's a mess. But what I see you running toward is beautiful and wonderful. And I want to know this Jesus that you're chasing hard after. We have to run as though eternity depends on it. Why? Because it does. It does. We, we have an impact. We have a blast zone around us that we are impacting people, whether you admit it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, there are people around you who are influenced by your life and you're either running hard after Jesus and pursuing him with everything you can so that you can stand before him and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have run the race. You now win the prize. Let's pray together. Father, in this place, we want to be people who run hard after you. God, to run in such a way as to get the prize. God, I want to live a life of determination. I want, I want to live a life of focus. I want to live a life of discipline. God, my years here are short compared to an eternity that I will spend in your presence. You're holy, you're righteous, you are sovereign. You've invited me to come to yourself. You've given me salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ as a gift by grace through faith. And Father, now I just want to run 
in such a way that I can get the prize when I stand before you one day. In Jesus' name, amen. I trust that is your prayer. I truly trust that is your prayer with me this morning. We're going to enter a time right now, uh, and I, I just want to invite you. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never come to know Christ. We want you to know him personally, not just know about him. We want you to know him personally. And if you've never given your life to Christ, we'd love to have that conversation with you. In just a moment, some folks are going to follow the Lord and Believer's baptism over here. And I'm going to be right over here. If you want to come and talk or pray or you've got a question, I'd love to talk with you. There's a little QR code in the seat back right in front of you online. You can chat in the comments and we'd, we'd send you a link. Maybe you have a question. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you're just being honest and vulnerable, wrestling with God. It's okay. Listen, God's not afraid of your questions, okay? He's not afraid of your questions. Just bring it to him. Maybe you've trusted Christ, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. I have three kids all grown, gone, and married, but here's one thing I know about every single one of them. They began to walk with one step. When we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we begin to take small steps of obedience, and we begin to run a race by first taking a step of obedience. If you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, that is a first step of obedience to walk with him. If you want to do that this morning, we'll do it right now. <laughs> During this time, you can either come and we'll just jump in the tank and we'll do it. Or you can go out there and they'll give you some shorts and a t-shirt. However you want to do it, we'll do it. Maybe you've never followed the Lord and this morning you want to do that. We, we will be doing baptisms again next week, but if you're going, I need to do it right now, then, then let's do it. Small steps of obedience over a long period of time have a significant difference. So as we turn our attention to baptism this morning, the praise team's gonna come, but let's just turn our attention to the screen. Here are a few testimonies of some of those that are being baptized this morning. Hi, my name is Ava, and I wanna get baptized because I wanna show people that I'm a Christian and that I love God. Amen. Hi, I... I'm Mateo Whitfield, and I am here today to get baptized because I want to grow in my faith and show everybody that I love Jesus. Hi, my name is Aaron, and this is why I'm being baptized. Why I am being baptized is because I want to follow Jesus forever, and the other reason is because um, Jesus is our Savior, and Lord, um, and Lord, and I hope I can follow him. Hi, I'm Ann Suya Carroll, and I would like to be baptized today. The reason why is I grew up in an in, um, Indian household where we followed the Hindu faith, and I have attended the temple several times as a child, but I never felt the presence of God. Um, however, after troubled times um, and being in foster care and many things, I found God through church and through my foster family and I was never baptized and uh, was afraid to because there's a lot of fear of doing things out of ritual when you're part of the Hindu faith or, you know, many faiths, honestly. But. I'm not afraid anymore, um, and I would like to be baptized to follow God and out of discipline and not out of ritual. Hi, my name is Liam, and today I want to be baptized. I've been going to church for three to four years, and I want to follow through with what Jesus has asked me to do. Hi, my name is Lucas, and I'm getting baptized today because one, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, and I believe that Jesus is my friend, and I want to show people that I am close with God. Hi, my name is Olivia, and I would like to get baptized because I want to show people that I trust Jesus and that I'm going to spend eternity with Him. I am Austin, and I want to be a follower of Christ, uh, and I love Jesus, so that's why I'm going to get baptized. and. 
I've been thinking like be a good example to my class and read my Bible, try to do it like mostly read it every day. I can't do it and try to not sin as much and like tell the truth. So that's why I want to be baptized. Hi, my name is Jacob and the reason I'm being baptized is because I put my trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for me and I want to obey his command and show the world how much I love him. Amen to that. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet as we celebrate um, just new life and baptism today and celebrate G Jesus and who he is and who he's called us.
day. There's nothing, nothing like being in the room to gather with other believers, to share the joy, to share the hope that we have. Maybe you came in here without that hope. We want you to leave with that hope. Maybe God is still dealing with your heart. We're, we're going to draw this time to a close, but it's not over. Okay. God's going to continue to meet with you. If you leave this place, he's going to continue to meet you. He's going to continue to teach you. If you need to stay in this space and just spend a moment, we encourage you to do that. There's no reason you have to run out of here. Maybe God's tugging on your heart. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you've made a decision. You're not sure what to do. Scan that QR code in the seat back in front of you and you can just reach out to one of the pastors or something. We'd love to just get with you, talk. Let's, let's help you keep running the race toward Jesus. If you've been around Southbridge for a little while or maybe you're new um, immediately after we uh, close our time, to your left, my right, out these doors, uh, we're holding what we call First Step. It's just an introductory time, a chance for you to come to get to know some of our leadership, some of our pastors and staff, and, and we'd love to just meet with you right there. Come by, say hi, uh, kind of find out what we're about and, and kind of where do we go from here. Thanks to this team. Bryce, thanks for your leadership and all that you do. <clears throat> just leading us leading us to the throne of grace. Um, check out sfchurch.com. There's things going on. There's stuff coming up. Vision Weekend's coming up. Launching a financial peace class. Um, information's at Next Steps. You can scan that code, just get some information. Uh, guys, we are running the race together, determined, focused, and disciplined to honor Jesus with our life. Amen? Father, you are good and you are faithful. We thank you for meeting us. God, we thank you for teaching us, giving us instruction, training us in righteousness for your kingdom. God, send us from this place with the power and authority of the Holy Spirit in us, going before us. God, to seek and to save the lost, to train those up, to equip one another. Father, to continue to live out your vision, your mission, and your kingdom work. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.